And Jim, it's all you. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, right now you can see my picture, but I'm going to now uh, switch my picture to the beginning of uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we welcome you for being here, and thank you. And um, like, like Zach said, we're going to be talking about preparing for drought um, uh, and focusing mainly on turf and landscape uh, situations. Uh, we all know that um, drought happens almost everywhere, at least part of the year, whether uh, you're out uh, west in the southwest where drought is a perennial concern, or here in Florida where you have uh, winter and uh, early spring dry seasons that uh, turn into drought, or you have normal summer drought that happens July, August, and early September, like you see in the Midwest and the Northeast. So we're going to be covering a lot of drought issues and then talk about a bunch of tools that can uh, be used to help prepare and manage drought as you get through the season. But first, a little background on Ecologel. Uh, it was founded in 1991 by a gentleman called uh, Rick Irwin. And uh, uh, we joined together with ArborJet in a partnership two years ago in 2018. And then together, we offer a broad array of uh, products uh, for all sorts of professional markets. And uh, we have a reputation for having very high quality products that are committed to being environmentally responsible. And we have a lot of great technological people from uh, myself as a certified agronomist to some PhDs and some very talented people in the field. Um, and so we engineer products to cover everything from the roots right up to the crown of the trees. So everything in between. So on this broader range of uh, materials, these products we develop cover a variety of uh, all sorts of landscapes, not only for home and uh, garden, sports, turf, and things like that, but also into uh, agriculture as well, like hydroponics and uh, gardens and commercial vineyards and orchards. So moving on to drought, uh, what is drought? Um, a lot of people have different definitions, and uh, the 1959 Glossary of Meteorology um, defines it as a period of abnormal dry weather sufficiently prolonged for the lack of water to cause serious hydrological imbalance in the affected area. That's pretty broad in its definition. So when we actually get into it in the field, we look at four different perspectives of drought. There's what's called a meteorological drought, which is simply as a... Um, precipitation is behind what is normally expected. But that doesn't tell us a lot because uh, what might be a drought here in Florida where we get 40 to 50 inches of rain a year or more may be a monsoon in a place like New Mexico or Arizona where they only get 9 to 12 to 15 inches of rain a year. So that doesn't tell us a whole lot. There's also a hydrological drought that... Uh, looks at uh, surface and subsurface water supplies and, and uh, determines whether they're at normal or below. And when they're below, it's considered a drought. We also have social uh, economic ones that uh, affect whether we have water to drink or even uh, recreation to take your boat out or go fishing. Uh, that might be a kind of drought. But what we're going to consider today is called agricultural drought. And this is a situation where there is not enough moisture in the soil to meet uh, the requirements of a crop. And uh, today we're going to specifically be looking at turf and ornamentals. There's some new technology or some new terminology that is uh, coming out in the news in the last couple of years. And one of them, in the last month, we've seen a lot of articles on a, uh, a kind of drought called a mega drought. And what that's being uh, defined as as a period of drought that lasts 20 years or more. And uh, the one that most people are familiar with uh, is the, uh, the Dust Bowl era in the early 1920s and then into the 30s. So that was a period of over 20 years. Um, all this talk about mega drought is originating from an article in the science journal Science, uh, which uh, last month had an article talking about uh, droughts that they measured, mega droughts they measured using tree ring data from a, a variety of sources, particularly out west. And they've identified uh, uh, several mega droughts that have occurred since the year 2000. 
And they say that we are now in a mega drought that started in the, around 1999 or 2000 and is expected to continue for several more years. And those who live in California or Arizona or even in West Texas uh, probably know what they're talking about. But this uh, mega drought is affecting everything uh, in the southwest from Texas into Mexico and up through the west coast into western Canada. And uh, this current mega drought is considered to be uh, a rival to the worst one on record that occurred in the 1500s. And that one lasted almost 100 years. So there's a lot of articles on mega droughts right now. Another one that came out last fall was the term flash drought. And one uh, article defined it as a bout of unusually warm temperature with lots of sun, low humidity, and high wind conditions. And they all come together at once to dry out the soil surprisingly quick. And we saw this first used in uh, October last year. And uh, it was used to describe a drought that occurred throughout most of the southeast United States. Uh, you'll see that that drought last fall went west of the Mississippi and Arkansas and Missouri, as far north as Ohio, and, and throughout the southeast into Georgia and the Carolinas. So these are things that are occurring today in our lives and affect our plants and how we manage them. Now, the United States uh, has what's called a drought monitor, the USDA, and this is the current one for this week, and it shows that uh, uh, big chunks of the country already at, in the springtime abnormally dry, and even in many areas are e experiencing severe to extreme drought, um, and this is expected to expand. Uh, worse of it is from central California north and along the Gulf Coast, uh, in, here in Florida over to Texas. Now, as the year goes on, uh, this is a drought monitor shot from uh, August of 2018. You can see how drought uh, expands into the summer and covering much more of the country. And each year is a little bit different. Uh, some play in times the Midwest is fine while New England or the Southeast is dry but we can expect drought almost anywhere, and we need to protect, pre prepare for it. And preparing for it is a lot better on our plants, our pocketbooks and everything than trying to react after it occurs. Uh, snapping back to today, and this is a, a snapshot of Florida right now. Um, we're saying that 55% of the, the state's population, over 10 million people, are experiencing drought conditions. And when they add uh, abnormally dry areas, we're up to over 95% of the population is experiencing drought or extremely dry conditions. And that's being uh, observed through things like the four major wildfires in the Panhandle and down in Fort Myers, southwest Florida, we're now having water restrictions and water uh, conservation efforts kicking up. And we switch to the west coast where we see that Oregon, 80% of its population is in drought. Uh, and if you add the abnormally dry area, that takes it up to 99% of the population. So they're already in the spring experiencing very dry conditions. And we bounce back to the south. We're in Texas along the coast, like we talked about. You know, over 5 million people are experiencing drought conditions already in Texas, with another 12% of that population uh, experiencing uh, abnormally dry. So we're already in this situation. We need to start thinking about drought and how to prepare it anywhere we are in the country. So what is the impact on drought in the green industry and for our businesses? You know, uh, as we're seeing here in Florida already, and I'm hearing words out west about water restrictions where you're only allowed to water so much every week. Uh, we see water bills starting to climb and that's impacting the bottom line for families as well as businesses. Uh, we're seeing stressed out landscapes that uh, start going dormant, uh, losing color, and even death of plants. That translates into unhappy customers or golfers who are used to a nice green golf course or, or proper, proper playing conditions, and uh, drought may uh, take those away. And then eventually ends up in uh, having to replace and remove dead turf and plant material. And all this can result in loss of business. And now that we're in a pandemic, we're business is really being hit, we need to lose as little business as possible. And this is the kind of business that we can prevent the loss of by just properly planning and treating. 
So as we see, as we get into drought seasons, we see uh, various social impacts. Uh, the right-hand picture is from California, where you know they, everyone's being told, save water. Uh, the one on the left is from Texas, uh, where they were restricting watering to once a week. Um, and I've seen it as bad as once every two weeks in past droughts. So these are coming at us depending where we are in the country, whether we see severe water restrictions or just uh, officials trying to get us to better conserve. Also affects things like uh, we talked about, those social economic situations where we see uh, reservoirs going dry. There is no water to use and, uh, again, pushes water restrictions, but also limits our ability to use uh, uh, for recreation these bodies of water. So what is drought stress? Uh, it's considered an abiotic stress, um, which happens when there's not enough water to meet the, uh, the plant's needs, that the plant's roots cannot absorb enough water to take care of itself. And, and that's key. When the plant's uh, water content is reduced enough to interfere with the normal plant processes. So we see the plant shutting down, losing color, wilting, and uh, thinning out and things like that. What are the economics of water out there and how does that affect our businesses? Uh, this is from a, a group called the Circle Blue that looks at average water costs per month in various parts of the country. And you can see in some parts of the country, uh, your monthly water bill is like a car payment. Uh, it's a ton and it includes things like water and storm water, sewer and, and things like that. And in some cities like Atlanta, it's huge. Um, you see in Seattle as well, but parts of California and the Midwest, water becomes a real issue from a cost perspective. When we move into things like golf, uh, the Southern uh, California PGA estimates that the average golf uh, course water bill is 700000 a year. And I've run into golf courses in the Southwest that have passed a million dollars a year. And that's a lot of money. That takes a lot of golf to make up for that. And the more you can save that, the more that goes to the bottom line or for other services. So some other economic factors affecting golf when we're in drought is things like you end up doing a whole lot of hand watering on greens and teas and perhaps other areas. That's a lot of labor costs. Uh, pumping costs uh, electricity. Uh, and we see situations where that's appreciable. Um, as uh, plants uh, get more damaged, they're more stressed, we see that they're less resistant to pests, and we see an increase in pesticide use. Uh, we see loss of turf and plants throughout a golf course, uh, perhaps a loss of revenues due to poor playing conditions. Uh, some golf courses choose to avoid, uh, to ignore water restrictions and, and agree to pay water fines, and that's uh, an increased cost. And also we see both in golf courses and lawn care uh, where the problems in our irrigation systems are. We start seeing circles in large areas going dormant and brown. What we see in a household use, this is a, from California where they've done a lot of research on, on water use. They say the average uh, homeowner uses 51% of their water in the yard and in the lawn. That probably is including uh, washing cars as well. And so that's where a lot of people really start looking at reducing water is in the landscape. And if you can reduce that uh, in some places, I've seen 50% is what they're shooting for in the short term. Now, the high bills of, for water can lead to a lot of problems for lawn care customers. Uh, customers stop watering, and then that stresses out the landscapes. We see that... Uh, the nutrients and fertilizers and pesticides we put out maybe aren't working the way they should. And so we also see the increased pest pressure. We have unhappy customers and sometimes that loss of business. And we have this quote on the bottom from this lady in Philadelphia that has trying to make a decision whether she pays for water or food and maybe rent. So it becomes very serious. And the more we can do to control uh, drought situations with our tools, the better we're going to be all around. Some other landscape factors that uh, economically that we need to consider is that, you know, the loss of plants and the plant replacement. Uh, it, uh, a study I found said that it's 3000 to almost $16,000 to replace the plants in a house. 
uh, depending on the size of the yard. Um, if you need to replace and resod a yard, it's an average of $3,000. Uh, if you choose to reseed, that's between three and $700. We also have the problems with callbacks. That's labor. You know, you got to go back and make a customer happy and see what the problem is. Uh, we also see where irrigation problems are in the landscape. Uh, we see those mist areas that become dormant and brown. And then because of poor plant quality, uh, Turf Magazine says that uh, high quality plants increase the property value of a house 10 to 12 percent. And that's tens of thousands of dollars in most situations. And then we see the increase of pesticide use because stressed out turf and plants uh, are more susceptible to uh, pests. So what about water agronomics? Let's get into the, the plant side of things. Um, you know, the, the drought stress, as we've indicated already, can be a primary contributor to the death of a plant and lead to a more disease and insect pressure. And so that plants that experience less stress because we're taking care of them, we're using some of the tools we're going to talk about, will more actively resist pests and survive better and look better. What are some of the, the situations enhanced by drought in the landscape? Uh, we see on the left with turf grass, things like anthracnose and grub damage and chinch bugs and crabgrass breakthroughs, all sorts of things that are affected by drought that uh, cost money, it costs callbacks, it costs uh, the quality of our landscape. On trees, we see similar things with insect attacks of various insects and root rots and things like that start invading our trees and uh, damaging them. One of the things out of Turf Magazine in May of 2017, they looked at the top five, the top strategies to battle the top five to turf diseases. And the one that attracted me the most as a water guy is more soil moisture. Uh, if you maintain healthy soil moisture, your turf grass is going to be more resistant to your top five turf grass diseases. We also see that when you get into looking at uh, uh, the quality of turf. Uh, this is a couple graphs on relative water content. The top line with the solid squares is just normal, decent uh, irrigation and water stress, a uh, water situation. The next one down with the stars is just uh, heat alone. And heat has a detrimental effect on water content but near, not nearly as bad as the next one down, these uh, solid diamonds, that is drought stress. Drought stress has, as an individual, the worst detriment on water content of turf grass. And then when you combine heat and, and drought together, it just is the worst. And we see both those situation in tall fescue and Kentucky turf uh, bluegrass. When you look at turf quality, it's, it shows the same pattern. Um, under optimal conditions, uh, quality stays the same. Under heat, certainly quality decreases, but drought has the greatest effect. And when you combine heat and drought together, it is uh, just so detrimental, it's, it's toxic to the turf grass. So anything we can do to prevent uh, your turf from going into drought stress, because we can't do a whole lot about heat. Uh, you can't put air conditioners out in your yard or on your golf course but you certainly can do things to control moisture in the soil and help prevent drought stress. Some of the effects on plants we see here on the left, uh, looks like a fairway where you've got this model condition where you've got these localized dry spots and you pull plugs out and the left hand plug is, uh, is powder dry while the right one is still got good moisture and holding together. Or we see potted plants where uh, after a week of no watering, one's uh, fading away and it's going to die, or the other one that has been maintained with uh, one of our tools we're going to talk about, it is fine. We see on a golf course where uh, irrigation fails or where irrigation can't keep up, and we see dormant turf occurring. We see patches of uh, fairways fading out, uh, slopes and bunker mounds and green surrounds starting to lose color and go dormant. We go into parks on lawns and we see wholesale uh, dormancy and plants, uh, the turf just not looking great. We get into St. Augustine, uh, which we have a lot in the south, where you'll even lose it completely. It'll fade away and die and you'll have bare soil. We get into trees, there's lots of examples of 
losing color, you've got the, the leaves dying and going dormant, and just overall poor quality. Uh, same way with uh, bushes. Uh, you start losing leaves, you start losing color, you're getting chlorotic, uh, die back and things like that. So what are some of the tools we use to manage for drought stress? Obviously, a healthy plant is the best defense. Uh, so we have these tools to reduce drought stress and help maintain these healthier plants. And the first one I listed here was uh, a properly designed and maintained irrigation system so that you can put the right amount of water at the places you need it. Also, it's important putting the right plant in the right place. You don't want to put a, a, a shady plant in the direct sun. You, don't, you want to choose varieties of turf grasses that are more drought tolerant, more heat tolerant, and favor the conditions you have in your local place. Uh, soil barriers, mulches, and organic matter are very important to helping maintain um, plants during drought stress, particularly bedding plants and uh, trees and shrubs and, and things like that in beds. We have these super absorbent polymers we hear a lot about. And everyone's heard about wetting agents or surfactants. We'll also get into hydroscopic humectants, uh, touch on biostimulants and plant growth regulators, and finally, proper nutrition. So what are, before we get into those, what are some of the cultural and management practices that help us to give our plants the best foot up when we get into drought? And certainly, uh, turf grasses uh, is trying to cut your, your turf as high as possible. Uh, what the customer allows or what uh, play on sports and golf field, golf courses allow, uh, but cutting them high because that helps reduce stress and helps minimize water con consumption. And then also cutting turf as frequently as needed to avoid scalping. Uh, scalping is a great stress on turf and really can be a, a problem in sending extra stress during a drought season on that turf. We want to reduce compaction in both turf and in ornamental beds because the compaction uh, prevents water from entering the soil readily. We want to test our soil so we can adjust the soil pH and correct nutritional deficiencies. These optimal conditions will allow the plant to feed and be in conditions that help minimize this plant stress. And we also want to avoid over-fertilization, which happens a lot when you're promoting too much growth, whether it's turf or shrubbery and other things, you're eating up energy and resources that the plant need to uh, counteract drought stress. Uh, it also, in, in fire-prone areas, can add extra tinder that can become part of the wildfires. So when we go into soil barriers, mulches, and compost, the benefits of these things is they help conserve moisture by slowing evaporation in beds and things like that. They help retain moisture in the root zone. They maintain optimal soil temperatures, uh, keeps that sun off that soil and keeping it from drying out and getting too hot for the roots. Uh, reduces erosion and compaction. Uh, it can reduce weeds that compete for water and nutrients. And then adds that valuable soil organic matter. So compost is one of those things that a lot of people uh, some people use, some people don't, but it, it's been shown over and over again to increase the increased organic matter helps with infiltration rates. It allows water that is put out there enter the soil readily. It increases soil water holding capacity. So once you get water in that soil, it holds it longer and better. And then we're seeing that amended, properly amended soils can uh, reduce water requirements up to 60%. And this table here from the EPA really gives it quite startling, uh, the, the kind of results you can get with compost. For every 1% of uh, increase of organic matter content, you're reducing irrigation needs by, you know, 16 or 1,000 or more gallons. Uh, I don't expect anyone to be putting 9,000 wet tons per 1,000 square, or 9,000 wet pounds per 1,000 square feet in most situations, but you can see the kind of effect on helping to decrease irrigation needs and keeping plants out of drought stress. We also, in our, in our BioPro line, have a couple of organic builders in the, in the product line. One is called Enviroplex. It's a 22% humic acid material, and that helps uh, it's that organic matter in the soil. It helps tolerance to uh, midsummer st stresses, such as drought stress. It helps support microbial activity. We also have a product called BioMP that has molasses 
that helps uh, increase decomposition of thatch and other litter that add that valuable organic matter back into the soil and then helps restore a healthy biology and promotes uh, your soil microbial activity. Now, water absorbing uh, polymers or hydrogels are been around for probably 35 years or so. Uh, there's a couple different kinds. You hear about a linear one that actually dissolves in water. It's used somewhat in agriculture and also can be used in reducing uh, irrigation-induced erosion. The one we see in landscaping most are these uh, insoluble cross-links. They form these gels with water. Uh, they're little powders like you see in the, on the left-hand side of this plate, and when that water is added, they expand and become a gel. And there's all sorts of um, brands out there. We see them in a number of places. But the idea is that, with, as you see in this graphic on the right, is these, these particles are dispersed through the soil. When water is added, they swell up like sponges, and they hold the moisture, and the plant uh, uses it. And, and these are good products for things like ornamentals and color installation. They can help reduce wilt and the water requirements because you get more mileage out of the water you, you put in the soil. One of the challenges with these products is they have to be incorporated in the soil, and that gets to be difficult on established turf grass or uh, ornamental beds. Um, they can only absorb water when water is plentiful. If it's not around and abundant, uh, they're not going to do you a whole lot of good. And there's some concern, and you look at the research about how long they last. We've seen some claims as long as five years or more in the laboratory, 10 years, but they seem to be harmed by the amount of salts, either fertilizer salts or, uh, or sodium type salts that are in the soil. The more salts that are there, the more it messes up their internal chemistry and, and shortens their, lively, their lifetime. So you see pictures about some of these gels and how roots will penetrate them and wrap around them. So when we move into things like wetting agents or surfactants, wetting agents are substances that reduce surface tension uh, of liquids and allow them to penetrate into things like soil and other areas. A surfactant is a kind of wetting agent. It stands for surface active agent. And again, it's like a detergent, but it helps reduce surface tension of water and allows it to enter into the soil. And we see uh, when we get into drought, um, hydrophobic conditions where the soil is resistant to accepting water and it will bead on the surface like we see in these pictures. We also will get channeling where water will flow across the surface and exit the soil in the easiest way possible, which would be these channels. And these are what cause localized dry spots and turf and other areas. So uh, it will be wet in one, one flow and in another area it will be dry. We see also things getting so hydrophobic, and particularly in droughty situations, that water will just flow across the surface of the soil and that uh, it won't enter into the soil. So these surface, uh, uh, these uh, wetting agents or surfactants, there's a variety of chemistries and formulations out there, and, and they all perform in different ways from allowing penetration to moving through the soil to expanding through the soil and all that. Their greatest thing in helping drought is to allow water to enter the soil and disperse evenly through the soil so that uh, prevents runoff, it prevents channeling, it prevents evaporation from the soil. And so it allows the soil to absorb as much as possible and retain it. Um, it allows more even distribution of the water in the soil. But uh, studies indicate that these need to be applied fairly frequently to soils. Now we're going to get into hygroscopic humectants, which uh, many people have heard of, but uh, as it, it's becoming more and more popular. A hygroscopic material is a material that absorbs or attracts moisture out of the air. And I want you to think about a cold drink you get out of the refrigerator and you get sweat on the outside. That's what like a hygroscopic material does. It takes water vapor in the gas state and converts it into the liquid state. A humectant is something that absorbs and holds that moisture once it's condensed sort of like you see with skin moisturizers or uh, shampoos. So our Hydrotain, one of the products uh, we provide, is a blend of these hygroscopic humectant compounds. And they're designed to help ma manage soil moisture between irrigation and rainfalls and is an ideal product to use in uh, preparing for droughts. Now I'm going to switch screens quickly and do a quick little demonstration. I have a, oh, a K2 
camera hooked up, a uh, microscope hooked up to my um, computer, and I'm putting a, a powder. I'm going to show you again. Uh, this is the microscope, and here is the powder. It's a white powder. You can see I put it on, on the microscope slide, and you can see the powder. And you see it's humid enough here in Florida that it's already changing in the water. And when I blow across it, you see that it's taking the humidity out of my breath and changing it into drops of water. And that's what this hydrotane does, a hygroscopic humectant material. So I'm going to go back to my computer screen. And so that is what the hydrotane is. It's a, it's a molecule that attaches itself to the root surface and soil particles and attracts humidity to itself, sort of like this powder is, or like we talk about a cold drink out of the refrigerator. So as humidity escapes out of the soil, uh, there's liquid waters put in through rain or irrigation. It evaporates and works its way out of the soil, and the hydrotane molecules trap it, condense it, and allows the plant to use it. And so the difference between hydrotain and, say, a wetting agent, a wetting agent improves the penetration of water, movement, and dispersing of water through the soil. A superabsorbent polymer is like a gel. It's a sponge that takes moisture and expands and holds it for a while. The hydrotain is actually taking the soil out of the atmosphere in the soil, condensing it into little droplets, and allows the plant to use it. So they all have different technologies, but this hydrotain is a very unique a very profitable product to use uh, during drought situations. To give you some examples, here is a, a, a plot treated in Australia in the early days when it was first invented. And uh, this was treated during uh, a, a wet period when the whole lawn was green. And you can see six weeks into a drought, it's helped maintain the color and the density of that turf. When we get into golf use, uh, this is a fairway that is very sandy on top of a coral rock shelf. It was drying out, and most of the wetting agents weren't helping. It was just too shallow and wasn't working. After an application of the hydrotane, within 10 to 14 days, you had the density back, the color back, and they found that it lasted 90 days. We also see on golf course slopes, and we see this in the lawn care side too, where a slope uh, that dries out fast or is going to shed water too quickly and flood down below. This is a, a rough area in, in California where both sides receive the same amount of water, but you can see the hydrotain condensing enough moisture and giving it to that plant so under the reduced watering, the turf is still in good shape. We have uh, golf courses who inject it through the irrigation system, through fertigation. And here's a letter from a University of uh, Texas golf course in um, Austin, where he said he, he got by with 33% less water without sacrificing turf quality. He also saved enough money in irrigation costs, the electricity, to help pay for the product. When we get into sports fields, this is a public park sports field in the Sacramento area where um, the governor had caused them, forced them to reduce their water use. Uh, this, both of these properties on the left and the right reduced their watering by 50% but only the right side treated with hydrotain. It was a granular version, and it maintained turf even during a play in the fields, and uh, they also had a, a little fair and carnival on that the night weekend before this picture was taken. We see in sports fields, too, and overseas, getting ready for television, a, a trial with the hydrotain. Seven days later, the picture is taken, and you can see how it is helping to uh, bring that turf out of the drought stress it was experiencing. When we get into uh, parks and water savings, uh, it's been documented. We have this uh, Seoul Park in Ventura County, California, where they gave us their water bills from 2014 to 2015. And 2015, we were told, was a worse drought year than 14. Uh, they managed overall average a 37% reduction in water. And if you look at August, it was reduced almost 65%. And the, the water savings, they tallied at about $11,000. So better turf, good quality, saving money. 
Well, you're going to run into lawns. This is in Texas and Dallas, um, lawns that were struggling when water, uh, there was no rain for weeks. Uh, water, the air temperatures were well over 100 degrees. They were watering this every day and still getting these results. And then with an application of liquid hydrotain, they applied it, watered it in, and every seven days took a picture. So after the first seven days, after 14 days after treatment, and then finally 21 days after treatment, and they managed to reduce their watering from every day to every third day, and they were within watering restrictions. Originally, they were violating water restrictions there in Dallas. We also see where irrigation fails during drought periods, and then the turf starts to go dormant and thin and really look bad. Here's a lawn that had such an irrigation failure or miss uh, design. And after an application of hydrotain, we saw how it helped uh, recover. This is an unirrigated parking lot lawn in California, in Irvine, California. Uh, the grass is alive, it's got some color versus the untreated area, so it, it helps in those areas too. When we get into laying sod, here's a, in Saskatoon, Canada, where they laid sod and uh, just watered it in, walked away. They didn't treat it with hydrotain, they were starting to lose it. So they applied the granular hydrotain, watered it in with a watering truck, and the picture on the right is 17 days later after the hydrotain helped it to recover. We also, in growing sod, we see it in drought situations. This is a non-irrigated field, 400 acres, but they only had enough hydrotain to treat 250. And you see during the drought, there's a night and day dark uh, difference in how the quality of the turf. We also get into cemeteries where hydrotain is used to reduce water and it doesn't stain headstones or, or pavement. So that's, that's a real advantage. And this cemetery injected it through their irrigation system, through their fertigation system. Their goal was to reduce their watering by 20%, which they did. That turned into a water savings of $68,000. And the return on investment was 380%. And they gave us an update 19 months after they began, and they saved over 9 million gallons of water and $117,000 in water costs. Tremendous. Uh, that's a lot more than the hydrotain costs. We also see unique situations like here in Florida where um, you have forest fires and uh, this homeowner happened to treat with uh, hydrotain about a month before this fire and the, the, the fire officials were really surprised that the fire didn't dry out the grass and take the house. And it kept enough moisture in that grass to help keep it hydrated and prevent it from being dried out and burned. We see it now when you go into potted plants. You saw this picture before where one is treated with a drench of liquid and uh, the other is not. And a lot of homeowners go on week of vacation for a week or more. And this is what happened in this situation. The homeowner went for a week's vacation, there was no water, came back to this. And so we see a lot of cities around the country using hydrotain and its potted plants, hanging baskets and things like that to save the labor and the water of watering every day and sometimes multiple times a day. We see that in this hanging basket where this person treated the right-hand basket with a granular hydrotain, and this is four days in Michigan's uh, summer heat. And you see the differences in those impatience. It's dramatic. And even in planting, we have customers that will incorporate granular hydrotain in the beds at planting uh, also can use a drench of the liquid hydrotain. This is a bed that used the granular, and the only water this got all season in North Carolina was the local rain. It was rain, no additional irrigation. It made a huge difference. Preparing and maintaining and saving your landscape during drought. This is a University of Illinois study that looked at the three different kinds of hydrotain. There's the liquid on the left, then our QD, or quick dissolve, and then our organics is the third one from the left, and the far right is the control. And you can see how much better those plants developed after 12 days, better flowers, larger flowers. But the key to this study was looking at how it responded to drought. The researcher took all the plants down to what they considered a severe drought. That was at day 19. And then he watered them the next day, and you see the kind of response that the hydrotain helps protect even when you go into severe wilt, protect and bring back those, those plants. The control in this one actually died. We talk about road uh, 
tree type installations. We have a lot of people using hydrogen in the drench water and, and installing new trees. This was a, a boulevard where they did a trial. Every other tree they tested, they treat it with hydrogen in a drought year, and you can see the difference in the performance of these trees. It saves a lot of money not having to go back and hand water or to replace those trees that die later on because of the drought. So what's the timing for drought preparation with hydrotain? You know, we recommend that it should be done uh, on the onset of, before the onset of drought. We're looking at late spring or early summer, um, say now in May into June in most uh, areas, no later than beginning of July. Uh, the liquid and the hydrotain both work equally. Uh, the liquid is, um, is sprayed out, but the key to it is it has to be watered in within an hour or so. And some of our customers don't have the ability to water it in right away, so the granular is the best option for them, where they can go and spread it on a lawn or in the flower beds, and it has five days to get watered in. So the next time the irrigation runs, it's fine. The treatment lasts up to 90 days, and on lawns you apply it nine ounces per thousand initially with the liquid, and then every, repeat every 90 days, or in some sports turf and other high quality situations, they can put down a, a monthly application of three ounces per thousand. The granular is applied at 2.7 pounds per thousand every 90 days. With potted plants, you can do a liquid drench of a solution of two ounces of liquid per gallon of water, drench the plant like you saw in those pots before, and the granular you can mix in it uh, or even apply on the surface of soil at one pound per cubic foot of soil. And all this is, can be gotten with the uh, referring to the Hydrotain website, hydrotain.com. Now moving on to um, uh, biostimulants and plant growth regulators, uh, Cytogrow is one of our products that is a EPA registered cytokine product that has 50 parts per million of cytokines. And it's used to promote deeper, denser root systems, which can take up more nutrients, take up more moisture. It enhances lateral growth of plants and increases stress tolerance. And there's a lot of research out of universities, and Rutgers is probably one of the best universities that's done a lot of work on this. And they've shown that in the physiology and calcium management in the plant tissues, plants, particularly turf, can, in, can re, uh, survive droughts much better with the use of these seaweed-based products, particularly something like Cytogrow. And the use of Cytogrow, you would prepare for your turf for a drought by adding eight ounces per thousand in the spring, and then every month adding at four ounces per, point four ounces. Is there a quart per acre and a pint per acre? I got a decimal point off here. And other plants like uh, ornamentals and uh, beds, you mix one ounce of Cytogrow per three gallons of water and you drench the plants. And you can see the kind of regeneration on Bermuda grass. This is in uh, New Mexico. Uh, this Bermuda really regenerates a lot faster with the use of cider grow. You see in lawn care how the density, the color is better as the other side is drying out and starting to go off color. We also see the combination of hydrotain and cider grow being very good. They're very uh, uh, symbiotic, they work well together. This is a, a study with sod that took hydrotain and cidero mixed together and applied it to a, one of these uh, squares of sod. And the one on the top left has not received no water for 20 days while the next to it has gotten an inch a week, which is traditionally used a lot around the country, a half inch of water a week and then no water at the below the treated one. And they take those same four on the left and extend it 10 days, so 30 days without water. So we're seeing the use of cytokines and cytogro plus hydrotain working very well. We also have another seaweed product called Sea Extra that goes out at the same application rates, and it has a lot of the same attributes uh, that, that cytokines have. But these seaweed products also help increase the root potential for the plants and help with drought tolerance. Um, our sister company, Arborjet, our partners, also have a product that's Nutrude, which is, again, a combination of the hydrotain, our C extra seaweed extract, has humic, humic acids, has the surfactants we talked about, as well as nutrients. And this can go out on a monthly basement basis on, on for trees and, and ornamentals and things, and, and has all those attributes that uh, bring in that drought protection as well as uh, enhancing 
the quality of turf and, and plants. Another uh, product that, our, uh, that Arborjet has is called a short stop. It's a, a plant growth regulator, and in turf grass there are a lot of turf grow, uh, plant growth regulators, and a lot of them are these paclobutrazols products that um, help reduce growth, but uh, short stop works particularly on trees and uh, reducing growth, uh, but it also has a, an added effect of really helping reduce drought stress in these woody ornamentals. And, increase, and also increases chlorophyll content. And the, the paclobrutazole is something that reduces gibberellic acid production in the plant, and as a result, it also increases abscisic acid production, which is uh, produced in the plant to help regulate water stress. It helps shut down the, sto the stomatal stomates in the, and, and loses less water. So this is another one of those products that you can use to prepare for drought and your trees will do much better. And there are other products for turf as well with these, these plant growth regulators. And you can see some of the results uh, using short stop versus untreated and drought conditions. You see the discoloration and all that doesn't occur with use of short stop. Now we get into finally plant nutrition for drought. You know, one of the things I like to point out is we don't want to give plants excessive nitrogen that can, put, that can promote excessive plant growth and that consumes high, root carbohydrates and plant energy that uh, can be used instead for a drought response. So we, we promote things like re, use of slow release and controlled release nitrogens. Or if you're going to use a soluble or foliar product, you spoon feed it lightly, frequently. But also a lot of studies in the literature show that potassium, adequate potassium is excellent for drought tolerance in plants. We also will use the use of micronutrients to encourage color without promoting the excess growth that nitrogen product can, uh, can do. Uh, micronutrients such as iron, manganese, magnesium, sulfur, and zinc are all critical to chlorophyll formation and plant color. We also have some unique uh, plant elements that are coming more and more popular. Uh, one of them is silica that has been shown in a lot of research, especially in ornamentals and in vegetables uh, in the form of potassium silicate show to promote excellent drought tolerance in these plants. And then of course, in many parts of the country where you're using a lot of irrigation, you're getting salts that are in the water or bicarbonates like you see in the Midwest build up as seals the soil and prevents the um, water from entering soils. So what do we have that helps with those situations? We have a variety of slow-release nitrogen products. The Arborplex is one that's right now in our Arbor RX program that helps trees. Uh, it's got 50% slow-release nitrogen plus a lot of those uh, color-forming micronutrients. It's designed for trees, but I got people looking at it all the time for turf too. It's an excellent turf product. Then we have a Enviro N straight nitrogen, a 70% slow release nitrogen, and then the Greens Plus products uh, with and without phosphorus for those areas that have phosphorus restrictions. When we look at foliar uh, fertilizers for spoon feeding, the Turfplex products are those, and they all contain micronutrients for helping a color, and we have a, a phosphorus and a non phosphorus version for those states that ban phosphorus. Potassium is the same way. We have an Enviro K, which is a potassium carbonate, a little bit longer lasting. And then we also have a All K, which is a potassium thiosulfate with high sulfur, which uh, provides sulfur and potassium. When we look at micronutrients, there's a whole variety of micronutrients, from individual ones to combinations to help with that color we, I spoke about. So, and they're all chelated in some way with organic acid, citric acid, and things like that all excellent products for maintaining color, depending on what your, your plant is and your needs. Also, when you get into silica products, we have a straight silica that's made from potassium silicate uh, and also obtains uh, some organic acids. And we have what's called tough greens, which is designed for golf greens, for, um, for tournament preparation, for speed, for wear tolerance and things like that. These are all products that have uh, excellent silica sources that can be part of that toolbox to help uh, prepare and tolerate drought. And then finally, when we're talking about salts and bicarbonates, there's two products. NAX is a product that's a calcium product that uh, is a liquid 
<coughs> excuse me, that is used for uh, flushing salts. It's a quick uh, flush for sodium salts that can be applied as a liquid to all sorts of plants in the bedding as well as turf. And then neutralizes a high sulfur material that the sulfur converts to sulfuric acid in the soil and breaks down bicarbonates. And so it takes care of both the salt and the bicarbonates that can build up and seal the soil surface. So those are some of the tools we can talk about about uh, using uh, and preparing for drought and, and also in combating drought during the drought seasons. Um, there are a lot of things. They don't, not one is a silver bullet, but combined using local knowledge and needs, I uh, can do a lot to uh, help you get ready, prepare, and tolerate uh, drought situations. Uh, here is my contact information and all the websites where you can go. I forgot the arborjet.com uh, website as well where you can get the um, short stop and um, um, <laughs> uh, and their other products. And also out there, the Arborjet uh, personnel, there's a lot of people in field to support you. They are regions with uh, your um, technical support people, and then we have two people, Rebecca Knapp and Eric uh, Stephenson, who are turf uh, specialists who can help with golf and turf and things like that. Uh, the other people are, are very good tree people and can help you in, in many areas as well. So, Zach, I'm going to hand it back to you and see if there are any questions. 